So we'll get straight into the sermon. Um, I'm just going to warn you, my notes are double what I normally have. So if I preach for an hour normally, it's going to be two hours today. <laughs> nah, look, I'm going to get through this as fast as I can. And as I'm preaching this, I'm probably going to edit some of the things out um, if I feel like I've, I've overkilled certain points. Uh, but we're gonna, I'm going to be preaching on the Trinity. Um, the title of the sermon is These Three Are One. These Three Are One. There's a lot of controversy surrounding the Trinity. A lot of, you know, I don't think it's even that hard to understand. I'll be honest with you. I came to understand the Trinity as a young boy. I've had a view of the Trinity ever since I was young. It's never failed me. It answers all the questions, all the complicated passages in the Bible, in the Scriptures. And I'm just going to be sharing that with you today. But these three are one. First John 5, 7, the memory verse and what we just read. For there are three that bear record in heaven. There are three, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So what do we learn from that? We learn that there are three, and we learn that there are one. We learn that there are three, and we learn that there are one. Right? Now, you know, we do mathematics. We've done mathematics in school. Three is never one. All right? And one is never three. So those, immediately, as soon as you say there is three and there is one, you immediately know there's, there's going to be difficulty to understand that. Right? In our, in our uh, limited human minds, it's going to be difficult to understand. But that's why you need faith. Right? Without faith, it is impossible to believe God. We must just understand and accept that there are three, that God is three, and we must understand that God is one. And if you just stay there, you'll be fine. But if you go too far in one direction, you're going to get confused. If you go too far in the other direction, you're going to get confused as well. If you maintain a balance, and that's what I'm going to be teaching today, guys, maintain a balance in understanding the Trinity, that there are three and that there are one. Now, the Trinity is rejected by many uh, you know, professing Christians. It's rejected by many of the cults. You know, it's rejected by you know, uh, you know, Islam and Judaism. And yet, 1 John 5, 7, it doesn't surprise me that this passage, is, this verse is removed from the modern versions, right? Because they want to take anything that gets you to understand the nature of God. But 1 John 5, 7 is found in the King James Bible, but not found in many of the modern versions, okay? So that's one of the best passages, one of the most clearest passages we have on the Trinity. The Father, the Word, also the Word's also the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. But another passage, and by the way, like I said, I've got a lot of notes, so I'm just going to read through them. If you don't have time to turn those passages, that's fine. If you've got a pen, take down the references. You know the sermons are on YouTube, audio and video. So if you need to go back, please feel free to go back and listen to it. But I'm just going to speed through the references. I've got over 85 verses to get through today. All right. But there are three main passages that I find that are very clear on the Trinity. That was the first one, 1 John 5, 7. The second one is during the, uh, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name, the singular name, right? Whether that's a name or the authority, however way you view that, but it's a singular nature, the one God, baptizing them in the name of the who? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So we have the one and we have the three in Matthew 28, 19. Also we have when Jesus was baptized. You remember that? It's found in all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I'll just read to you from Luke. Luke chapter 3, verse 21 to 22. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus, also being baptized, so Jesus, being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost, there's the second part, the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven. There's the voice, and who's the voice? Which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So if this voice is calling Jesus the Son, that's obviously the Father, right? We have Jesus, we have the Holy Ghost, we have the Father, all present during the baptism of Jesus Christ. I believe these are the three most obvious. You see them all there at, in one location, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And I, I, I believe these are the three main passages that if someone's struggling to understand the Trinity, these are probably the best passages to turn them to. All right, now, is the Trinity in the Old Testament? Is the Trinity in the Old Testament? Some people say, well, that's just a New Testament teaching. And some people think, well, God in the Old Testament was always the Father. That's not true. The Trinity is found in the Old Testament. Just a reference to the Father in Isaiah 63, verse 16. Doubtless thou art our Father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our Father, our Redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. So Isaiah 63, we have the everlasting Father here. His name is everlasting. He's the Father of Israel. 
even though Israel might not acknowledge him. Okay, that's what it's saying here in Isaiah 63 verse 16. What about reference to Jesus Christ, a reference to the Son? Yes, there is. There's a few. There's a lot. I'll just read a few of them. Psalm chapter 2 verse 7 says, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Okay, this is a psalm of David. And some people say, well, no, David is the son in this passage. But no, what we find in the New Testament, that this is a reference to Jesus Christ, the son of God. And further in that psalm, uh, number two, in verse 12, it says this, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Notice that this is a psalm of David, but is referring to now the son in a third person pronoun. Kiss the son lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So he's not referring to himself. He's referring to a third person pronoun, the son of God in Psalm chapter 2. And what about Daniel chapter 3 verse 25? We know the story of um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were cast into the burning furnace. Remember that? Nebuchadnezzar cast them into the furnace for not worshipping his image. And then they get cast in. They don't get burnt up. What is said of what's happening there? What does King Nebuchadnezzar say? He says in uh, Daniel 3.25, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, not just three men, but four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So there we have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego protecting them from the fire. Okay? And I like Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. Proverbs 30, verse 4 says, Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath, who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? So in Proverbs here, Solomon recognizes that there's God. What is the God name of God? And then he says, what is, the, what, is the, uh, what is his son's name? He recognized that there is a son of God as well in the Old Testament. Okay? What about the Holy Spirit? Well, that's a lot easier. The Holy Spirit, straight away, you open up Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. It says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God mentioned in the first chapter, the first uh, uh, mention of, uh, of the unique part of the Trinity, the Spirit. And then Psalm 51 verse 11, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Okay, so we have in the Old Testament references to um, the Holy Spirit, references to the Son, and references to the Father. We see the Trinity in the Old Testament. Okay, now, let's learn a little bit about the Father. Let's understand God the Father, who He is. First thing I want you to notice is that He is omnipotent. Omnipotent means all-powerful. Mark chapter 14, verse 36 says, this is Jesus speaking, and He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. All things are possible to the Father. He is all-powerful. This is an attribute of an all-powerful God. He is also all-knowing. He's omniscient. Omniscient. All-knowing. Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. The Father knows all things above all. Okay, He's omni. He's omniscient, He's all-knowing, another attribute of God. He's also omnipresent, that means all-present. He can be everywhere at once. Ephesians 4 verse 6, One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. So we have the Father, omnipresent, able to be in more locations than one, because He's above all, He's through all, and He's in you all. So He's in every believer, so He's omnipresent three attributes of God. Another unique attribute to the Father is that He's the highest in authority. He's the highest in authority as far as the Trinity is concerned. Ephesians 4 verse 4 to 6 says, There is one body, 
and one spirit. And by the way, this is another reference to the Trinity, but it's not as clear as those other three that I first gave you. But pay attention to this. Ephesians 4 verse 4, for there is one body and one spirit. Okay, verse 4, one spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. And then verse 5, one Lord, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse number 6, one God and Father of all. Okay, so verse 4 has the Spirit, verse 5 has Jesus the Lord, and verse 6 has God the Father of all. And then it says this about the Father, who is above all and through all and in you all, right? He is above all. We read that one. He's above all things. We just reference the Holy Spirit. We reference Jesus Christ the Lord. And it says, not only is He above all of you, but He's above all as far as the Trinity is concerned. When we talk about the Trinity, not only is there the Father... I'm, by the way, I'm going to turn this side when I talk about the Trinity and I'm going to go this side when I talk about the one God, all right, just to make it easier. But when we're on this side of the Trinity, we have the Father, we have the Word, and we have the Holy Ghost. And above the Word, Jesus Christ, and above the Spirit, the highest in authority in the Trinity is the Father. He is above all, okay? So when we talk about the Trinity being co-equal, you've probably heard that term, co-equal, there's a truth to that. They are co-equally God. They're as much God as one another. They're, they're co-equal in nature of God, but they're not co-equal in authority. God the Father is above the Son and above the Holy Ghost. Let me give you some more verses here. Jo uh, Jesus speaking in John 10, 29. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So Jesus says, the Father is greater than all. And then in Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 31 to 32. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, talking about Jesus, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great. So Jesus shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So even though Jesus is great, but he's called the son of the highest. Can you get any higher than the highest? No, the highest, the son of the highest. That's referring to God, the father. He is the highest. Okay, and if you just have any doubts, it's going, no, no, Kevin, Jesus is, is just has as much authority as the Father. Well, Jesus says, not so in John 14, verse 28. He says, Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Okay, so I'm not, you know, you know um, putting down Jesus Christ. He is great, right? He's greater than all of us. He is the great God. But even Jesus Christ says that the Father is greater than I, okay? In the, the mouth of Jesus Christ alone. So you must understand, when we look at the Trinity, the Father is greater. He's greater than the Son and greater than the Holy Spirit. That's a unique character of the Father. Though there's a lot of characteristics that all three in the Trinity have in common, there are some characteristics of the Trinity that are unique to each person of the Trinity. Okay? Now let's look at the Word, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. First of all, He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. In Revelation 1 verse 8, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So if He's all-powerful, um, the, uh, sorry, <laughs> omnipotent. He says that he is the almighty. It's the same thing. All powerful, all mighty. He has all might. He has all power, referring to Jesus Christ. And then he's also all knowing. Uh, John, chapter what, uh, John chapter 21, verse 17. Jesus is speaking to Simon Peter. And he says, He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, Jonas lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Look what Peter says unto Jesus. And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. So Jesus Christ knowest all things. Okay? He's omniscient. He's all knowing, just as much as a father. And he's omnipresent. He's all present. He can be everywhere at once. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 20. Jesus says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all way. So I am with you all way, 
even unto the end of the world. He's talking to all his disciples. No matter which parts of the world his disciples went, preaching the gospel, baptizing, teaching them to observe all things. Jesus says, I'm with you, with you all, always, even unto the end of the world. So he can be everywhere at once. He can be with all his disciples at once. He's omnipresent. He's all present, can be everywhere at once. Now, Jesus Christ was sent by the Father. Okay? Now, this is what I want you to pay attention to. Even though God the Father is highest in authority, the focus, the person of the Trinity, that's the focus of Scripture, and the focus of the Father and the focus of the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. Okay? You must understand that. Even though the Father is greater, he, it pleases Him that our focus would be upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything you read upon in the Scriptures is focused primarily on the Lord Jesus Christ. So he was sent by the Father. John chapter 17, verse 25. O righteous Father, this is Jesus speaking, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known thou, sorry, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Okay? Matthew 10, verse 40. He that receiveth you, Jesus speaking again, he that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. So Jesus Christ was sent. Jesus Christ is not the Father because he did not send himself, but he was sent by the Father. Okay, he was sent by the Father. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. This is a, a, a reading of the scripture that Jesus Christ reads in the synagogue, which originally comes from Isaiah. And by the way, the Trinity is in this reading as well. He says, because, because this is Jesus speaking, these are the words of Jesus, right? And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So we have Jesus speaking. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and set at liberty them that are bruised. So he that sent Jesus, we know as the Father, Jesus is speaking these words and he says the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. We have the Trinity in this passage. But I just want to show you that it is the Father that has sent Christ. Good. First one out of the way. <laughs> but I just want to reinforce to you, yes, we saw that the Father is the highest in authority, but I just want to prove to you that Jesus Christ is subject to the Father. Jesus Christ humbled himself not just upon this earth, but for all eternity, where he is subject to the Father. John chapter 6, verse 38 says, Jesus speaking, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So, Jesus Christ has a will that's separate to the Father. Do you see that? It's not just one will, but Jesus has a separate will to the Father. And Jesus says, I've not come to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So we see that Jesus Christ is obedient to the Father, not just doing what he wants, but doing what the Father wants. And that's the lesson for us. We ought to do the will of the Father, not seek our own will in our life. And then in Luke 22, verse 42, Jesus speaking again, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. This is before he was crucified on Calvary, right? He's saying it's not his will to suffer for all these things. You know, in his manhood, he understood the suffering, the pain that he was going to go through, the rejection by the Father. He was going to take upon the sin of the whole world. But he says, if thou be willing, if thou be willing, speaking to the Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know, no matter how hard it might be to do the will of God, you know, we might want to do our own will. No, we need to be subject as Christ was subject to the Father. And you might say, well, that's just on the earth, Kevin. No, even after he's resurrected, even after he establishes his millennium kingdom, and after everything on the earth is subject under Christ, we still read that Christ is subject to the Father. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27 to 28, it says, speaking of the Father, for he hath put all things under his feet, the feet of Jesus Christ now. All things are going to be put under the feet of Christ. It is God's plan that everything would be subject to Christ first and that Christ will be subject to the Father. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted 
which did put all things under him. Now in verse 28, And when all things are subdued under him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So it is the Father's plan to have everything subject under Christ and then for Christ to be subject under the Father. Do you see that? Okay. So even in the future, even going into eternity, Jesus Christ is subject under the Father and we are subject under Christ. Let's go to the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost. Is he omnipotent? Is he all-powerful? Yes. Luke 1, 35. And the angels answered and said unto her, said unto Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. So the Holy Ghost came upon Mary, who had the power of the highest. So that makes him the all-powerful God as well. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So we can see the Holy Ghost is supernatural, is not restricted by this world, but has the power of the highest. Who was the highest? The Father. The Holy Spirit is as powerful and all-powerful as much as the Father is. Now, is He all-knowing? Is He omniscient? Yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God knows all the things of God. He's all-knowing. He's omniscient. He's also all-present. Omnipresent can be everywhere at once. Psalm 139, verse 7 to 8. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? So where shall I go from your spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. So we have the psalmist who's saying, I can't escape your spirit. Doesn't matter if my, my place is in heaven or my place is in hell, even into eternity, behold, thou art there. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent, omnipresent, all present, can be everywhere at once. Now the Holy Spirit was also sent by the Father. John 14, verse 16 to 17, Jesus says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall send you another comforter. Another comforter. Okay, it's not Jesus Christ, it's another comforter. That he, am I, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the, uh, the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you. So, Jesus is praying or asking that the Father would send the Spirit of truth. But not only is He sent by the Father, but He's sent by the Son. In John chapter 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I, Jesus speaking, I will send Him unto you. I will send Him unto you. Okay? So we have the Holy Ghost being sent by the Father and sent by the Son. Now the main purpose of the Holy Spirit, as I said earlier, is to point us to Christ. He is not part of, the, he's not part of God or, or, or God, the Spirit, that is trying to gain attention of Himself. Okay? His purpose is to point us to Christ. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, pay attention, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Holy Spirit's job is to remind the believers the things that Christ has already taught us in His Word and, and what Christ has taught to His disciples during this time. Do you see? The Holy Ghost is not coming to teach new things. He's coming to teach and remind the things that Christ has already taught. Uh, John 16, 13. How be it? Uh, sorry, where am I here? Uh, yeah, here we go. John 16, verse 13. Uh, Jesus speaking again. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Pay attention here. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you, all, uh, show you things to come. So the Holy Spirit did not come to speak of Himself. Okay? He came to speak of Christ. And I've said this 
to some of you, you know, this is where a lot of the charismatic Pentecostal churches get this wrong. You know how much emphasis they put upon the Holy Spirit. You know how the focus just seems to be the Holy Ghost and, and being blessed by the Holy Ghost and given gifts by the Holy Ghost. And those things are true. There are gifts of the Holy Ghost given to us. But there is such a great emphasis where you know this, this is not the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit did not come to speak of Himself. The Holy Spirit came to point us to Christ. That is His job. Jesus Christ is the central figure of the Bible. The Father sent Christ and the Spirit points us to Christ. Okay? Now, one of the heresies that I've been hearing lately is denying the Trinity, but denying the Trinity by saying that the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is not a person. That the Holy Spirit is this impersonal force of God, this impersonal power of God, not this person. I don't know if you guys have heard that before. So that they'll accept the Father is God and they'll accept that Jesus Christ you know, is a person, you know, is God, but they won't accept G the Holy Spirit as a unique person, just as God's power. But the problem is that in John 16 verse 13, well, it's not a problem, it's fine for me, but in John 16 verse 13, we see that, uh, uh, um, that personal pronouns are used to describe the Holy Spirit. It says, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. That's seven times in this one verse, personal pronouns of the Holy Spirit. He, He's a person. And not only that, we saw that Christ had His own will, a separate will to the Father's will, but we see that the Holy Spirit has His own will in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. But all these things worketh that one and that selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severely, uh, uh, se uh, severally as he will. I'm not sure if I said that right. As he will. Talking about the gifts of the Spirit, that it is the Spirit's will to decide what gifts he's going to give to the believer. That's what it's being taught. That he does it. He divides these gifts according to his will. Okay, so we see that the Holy Spirit has a will, the Son has a will, and the Father has a will. And so we can rightly say, as they are individuals, they are unique, and they are persons of the Trinity. Each one of those, each three of those. Okay, now let's talk, talk about the one God. So we know there's three. We know the Father has authority, He has sent the Son, and then the Holy Spirit was sent by the Father and the Son. Okay, we see this structure of authority. We see this structure of sending. But now we need to look at this side of the equation. The one God. These three are one. The one God. In the Old Testament, we read a lot about the one God. Deuteronomy 4.35 Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, He is God. There is none else beside Him. Okay, we don't believe in many gods. We don't believe in polytheism. We reject the, you know, the teachings that there are many gods out there. We reject even if people say there are three gods. No, there are three, but they are one God. Okay? There is none else beside him. Deuteronomy 4.39 Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. 2 Samuel 7.22 Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, Neither is there any God beside thee. Neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. 1 Kings 8.60 That all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is none else. Okay, none else beside the one God. And you might say, well, who are they talking about, Kevin? Are they talking about the Father? Are they talking about the Son here? Are they talking about the Holy... They're talking about the one God. The one God who is free. 2 Kings 19, 15. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, and all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. So when we look at this side of the, of the Trinity, we see the three, and we know he's not alone there, right? Because he can be with himself, the Father with the Son, and the Son with the Holy Spirit. But then we look at this side of the Trinity, and the Bible says that thou, even thou alone, there's one God. He is God 
alone. There is no one else. And all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Isaiah 43.10 Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. There's no God before God, and there's no God after God. There is one God. Very clearly taught that in the Old Testament. Very clearly taught in the New Testament. Mark 12, 29. And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Romans 3, 30. Seen it is one God, which shall justify the circumcision by flesh and uncircumcision through faith. 1 Corinthians 8.4 And concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto gods, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. None other God but one. Galatians 3.20 Now a mediator is not a media mediator of one, but God is one. But God is one. Okay, so is God three? Yes. But is he one? Yes. Okay, you say that's contradictive. Hey, that's the nature of God. All right? Just accept the fact that your finite mind is not going to fully understand it. But let me tell you something. If you put your faith on this and you believe He's three and you believe He's one, you just say, hey, Lord, I might not understand, you know, the scientific, you know, uh, thought and how that works. Just believe what it says. And I promise you, if you believe, you won't get confused. Okay? And as you've already noticed, we can read passages and it makes perfect sense over here. It might not make perfect sense over here, but it makes perfect sense over here. And then we'll read other passages that won't make you know, sense over here, but they make perfect sense over here. The one God. All right? But it doesn't matter which side you're on. If it makes perfect sense here, where there's three, or uh, plural plurality, it doesn't make this any less true. It's still one God. And if it makes more sense over here, where there's one God, it doesn't make this any less true. Okay? The three and the authority within the three and the uniqueness within the three now i was going to i just wanted to preach on the trinity i didn't want to cover the controversy and i won't cover the controversy any in any uh you know you know i'm not, not going to go too deep into controversy but one of the some of you guys are aware of the controversy that's been happening especially with my previous church but the debate is over the use of the word persons and it, I find it so child. I, I find it childish, guys. <laughs> Debate of the use of the word persons. There are some that do not want to call each one of the Trinity a person. And they're like, no, God is one person. Right? And then you've got some over here that say, no, it's three persons, but don't want to call this side one person. Let me read some passages, uh, some uh, Bible to you here. Debate over the use of the word persons. Let's, so Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto him by his Son. So by the way, let me just give you one rule of interpretation when it comes to God. Whenever you read just God or the Godhead, or anything like that in the singular, just automatically go to this side, the one God, okay? But sometimes as you're reading, it's going, the context is going to describe who that God is. And in this case, it spoke about God in the singular, but then it says, spoken to us by His Son. So now we know we're talking about the Father, right? So we, we got the singular God, but His Son, who's the His? That's the Father. So we know that now this is a reference to the Father in the Trinity whom he have appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, speaking of Jesus being the brightness of his glory, the glory of the Father, and the express image of his person. So Jesus is the express image of his person. Who's his? The Father. So can we rightly call the Father a person? The scripture says yes, right? Jesus Christ is the express image of the, His person. Who? The Father. So can we go to this side and start calling the Trinity persons? Yes, we have the authority of the Scriptures 
to do that. Of his person, and upholding all things by the power, the word of his power, when he hath Ha, uh, sorry, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That majesty being the Father. All right, so we see that the Father is referred to as a person. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Paul writing, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For I forgave anything to whom I forgave it. For your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. In the person of Christ. Can Christ be called a person of the Trinity. Yes. So we see the Father is a person. We see Christ the Son is a person. Now, I, I don't, there's no way in the Bible that I could find that the Spirit is referred to as a person. But my point is, we can be on this side of the equation and say there are three persons. It's biblical. Don't be afraid to do that. Okay? When you start being afraid to do that, that's when you go into heresy. Where you start to go into, you're in danger of going into heresy. But then we've got Job chapter 13. Job chapter 13, verse 7 to 8. Will you speak wickedly for God? Okay, we're talking about the one God here. Will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for Him? This is Job speaking. And we know the words of Job are righteous and true according to God. <clears throat> Will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for Him? Will you accept His person singular his person will you contend for god so can we rightly on this side call god in the singular nature a person yes we can okay both sides we can say persons but i recognize that as a preacher and as a teacher when you use certain words you have to explain it and make sure there's no confusion okay because the danger becomes if I'm saying persons over here, and then I say person over here, the danger becomes that someone will say, well, maybe you're describing Jesus as the person. And so when you say person, you're taking Jesus and you're playing him over here. And so Jesus is the one God, and then Jesus becomes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You see that? You see it? But the Bible says, hey, it's fine to use the word persons either side. But as a preacher, and you guys know this, when you go soul winning, you know you avoid the word repentance. Because you know if you bring that up, you're going to spend a long time explaining what repentance isn't and what repentance is. And you know you can explain the gospel without going there. right? And so as a preacher, as a teacher, if you're going to use words, you've got to make sure you explain that. Because okay? you don't want to leave the hearer confused and asking questions. What do you mean? If you've got to call God a person, are you saying that you know, God is one person and he's wearing three hats? You know, modalism. But we see that the scriptures are fine, you can use person there or person there. Though as I preach future in the Trinity, I'll probably want to avoid that because I don't want to go through this explanation that I went through the last five minutes. <laughs> All right. So stay balanced. Three and one. The three are one. So as we read our Bibles, and I've learned this as a child, I probably didn't know how to express this or teach this until I was older and you know, I started to give it more thought. But I've always understood this as a child. Never confused me. I could read anything in the Bible about God. Never get confused. God is three. God is one. Okay? The plurality of God. Immediately in Genesis 1.26. And God said. Okay? And God said. One God. Let us. Us. Three. Right? Us. Let us make man in our image. Our us, our plurality, after our likeness, our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish in the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So, one God said, let us, how do we understand the us? The Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Isaiah 43 verse 10 says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, Okay, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, I, singular, I have chosen, that ye may know me and believe me and understand that I am he. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm just trying to get my head around what, why I wrote this. Uh, I'm just, just, I don't know why. I was just showing you the three. So there are times that you read in the Bible 
and it makes sense, let us, right, our image, it makes sense to look at God in the Trinity and understand the triune nature of God. And then there are other passages like Isaiah 43.10, you, you are my witness, says, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and, and understand that I am He, okay, singular, I am He, before me, singular, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So if you read that passage and try to understand that in the, you know, the, 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 the three, that's going to be a little bit hard because it's, it's I, it's me. Okay, so we understand it on this side, the one God. Now, so just get in that habit, guys. If it starts to get a little confusing, the nature of God, just go, all right, which part is the Bible focusing on? Is it focusing on this side or is it focusing on this side? Is it the three or is it the one? But regardless which side it's focusing on, the other side is true. Okay, never forget that. The other side is always true. Now, there can be some confusion, right? You might read the Bible. Let me give you an example in Isaiah 6, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? What? Whom shall I send? And who, shall go, who will go for us? That's how you understand it. It's not a contradiction. It's the one God. It's the three persons. Then said I, here am I, send me. Some other confusion people have. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, speaking of Jesus Christ, a prophecy of Christ, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. The name of Christ shall be called. These are names, if you want to call titles, what have you. Nevertheless, these are attributes of Jesus Christ. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Is he wonderful? Is he a counselor to us? Yes, he is. The Mighty God. Right? So we're speaking of Jesus. We know a person of the Trinity, but he's the mighty God. Okay? This side. The everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Is Jesus all of these things? Yes. Is this his name? Yes. Title, whatever you want to say. Regardless, these are attributes to Jesus Christ. We shouldn't be afraid to say then, the name of Jesus Christ here is the everlasting Father. And just a natural reading of that, you'll conclude it's God the Father. Just a natural reading, without having to put your pom-poms on and, and argue for one side or the other. Just a natural reading. The everlasting Father is God the Father. And if you say, prove that to me, in the same book, Isaiah 63 verse 16, Doubtless thou art our Father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, thou, O Lord, art our Father. Our Redeemer, thy name is from everlasting. So if that's not, in Isaiah 9, 6, if that's not the everlasting Father, as in God the Father, then who's this in Isaiah 63, 16? Is this another everlasting Father? I had someone say to me, Kevin, that's not God the Father. That's, uh, you know, Jesus is just another everlasting Father. You can be an everlasting Father. If your children are saved, right, they're going to last forever, and I'm saved, I'm going to last forever. I'm an everlasting Father. People, you get saved, that... So everyone can be an everlasting father. But that takes away from this title given to Christ, the definite article, everlasting, father capitalized with the F. It's something that's unique to Christ. How do we understand this? Didn't we just say the father is different to the son and the father has authority over the son? Yes, we did. But did you not notice that we changed to the mighty God? To the everlasting father? So what the Bible is saying is that the Father, as much as the Father is God, the one God, Jesus Christ is God. They are co-equal in nature. The Father is God, Jesus Christ is God, co-equal in nature, but not co-equal in authority, not co-equal in person on this side of the Trinity. But on this side, the one, they are the one God. Do we say here that God is the everlasting Father? We can say that. Can we say God is the Son? We can say that. All the attributes of the Father, all the attributes of the Son, all the attributes of the Holy Spirit are true to the one God. Okay? The name of Jesus Christ 
is unique to him, and I'll show you that later on, unique to the Son, but it is a name of God. One of many names that God has. Every attribute that you can give the Trinity is true to the one God. Okay? By the way, it's not three and one. It's not four in that sense. It's three and one, both true at the same time. Not four, not two, not ten, not fifty, not a hundred. The nature of God is three and one. That's the nature of God. Okay? Now, God might be able to um, you know, speak and manifest through different objects, you know, like the burning bush. You know, we, we see things like that. Nevertheless, that was still the one God and three. Okay, still three and one. So there's no need for confusion. There's no need for all this waste of time that goes on sometimes. <clears throat> John 14, verse 8 and 9. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffice of us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? So what's Jesus saying? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Is he saying he is the Father in that sense here that he replaced? Because if Jesus replaces the Father, guess what? You no longer have a trinity. No, that remains true. We go over here. The Father is God. Jesus is God. The Father is just as much God as Jesus is God. So if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. John 10.30 I and my Father are one. Of course. 1 John 5, 7, these three are one. So is it, any, is it surprising that Jesus will say, I and my Father are one? When we know that all three are one. So where, what are we, we're over here, aren't we? The one God. Not one, not a, a unity, right? A trinity, but over here, a one. One God. So do you see how when you read your Bible, if you just believe both, accept both, and just make sure that you understand what part is being focused on, you will never get into error. Both are true at all times. And whenever there are like bl these blurs, and there will be blurs, right? There, there, there are going to be blurs of line. There's, there's going to be times where you're not, oh, is, that the, is that the Father? Is that Jesus? Is that the Sp Holy Spirit? There are going to be times you read that. But again, whenever there's that blurring, just go over here. Of course, one God. Of course, one God. Let me give you some examples of this. I gave you some examples of the Father and Jesus Christ. But look at the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in Matthew 10, 20. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. So the Holy Spirit here is called the Spirit of your Father, the Holy Father, the Everlasting Father, God the Father. Romans 8 and 9. For ye are not, fle uh, for ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, and so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So now the Holy Spirit is given the name of the Spirit of the Father, of your Father, and the Spirit of Christ. Is it because the Holy Spirit is Jesus and the Holy Spirit is the Father? No. It's because it's one God. Okay? Turn your attention to this side when you get confused. Because we must maintain the uniqueness of the persons, the authority structure, and that which sent which along the way in history. <clears throat> now here's where people get confused, and this is where people start to get into heresy, is when they read these merging and this blur, right? And they know that the name of Jesus, let me just get the right context here. Sorry. <clears throat> They know that at the name of Jesus, that every knee should bow, right? They know that the name of Jesus is the greatest name of God. It is the greatest name of God. And they also recognize that the Father is greater than the Son. And so what people start to do is, well, if the Father is the greatest, but yet the name is the greatest, then does that mean Jesus is the Father on this side? Does that mean Jesus is the Son? Does that mean Jesus is the Holy Spirit? Can we call all three persons Jesus? And they probably have a thought saying, hey, I just want to glorify Christ. I just want to hold him up to the level that he deserves to be up to. That's probably their mindset. 
You know, he deserves to be as great as the Father. That's, that's probably what they're thinking. But that's not how we look at Jesus Christ. That's not how we look at his name. Let me show you this. Philippians 2. Actually, turn there. I want to show you this. Philippians 2 verse 5. Philippians 2 verse 5. Philippians 2, 2 verse 5 <clears throat> to 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man, of men. And being found in fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Is there any doubt of who we're talking about here? When we look at the Trinity, right? Do, are we, do we have any doubt of who we're referring to here in the Trinity? It's, it's Jesus Christ. He made of himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, the likeness of man, humbled himself, became obedient unto death, the death of the cross. Who died on the cross? Was it the Son? Was it the Father? Was it the Holy Ghost? It was the Son who died on the cross, right? We're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son, the one who was manifest in the flesh. Wherefore God also have highly exalted Him. You don't need to exalt Jesus any higher than what God exalts Him. But how did God exalt Jesus Christ? And given Him a name which is above every name. He's given Jesus a name above every name. Every name on earth, every name in heaven. Verse 10, and that the name, sorry, and at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. All people, all beings of heaven, of earth, of hell, the things under the earth are going to bow their knee before the name of of Jesus Christ it is the greatest name the name above every name and look at verse 11 and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is is Lord to the glory of God the Father to the glory of God the Father it glorifies the Father when we glorify the name of his son Jesus Christ it glorifies the Father to have given Jesus Christ a name that is above His own name. It's a name above all names. Think about that. It glorifies the Father to say, Hey, my Son, who was obedient unto death, I'm going to glorify Him. I'm going to exalt Him. I'm going to give Him the name of Jesus Christ. And that glorifies me as much as it glorifies Him. And so these people that want to take the name of Jesus and say, well, Jesus is the name of the Father and the name of the Holy Spirit as well. No, that does not glorify the Father. You think you're trying to glorify God by doing that, but no, it glorifies the Father to have that name for the Son, which is above every name. Do you see that? And so when you start to be afraid to call these three persons and you say, no, it's only one person and that person's name is Jesus and that Jesus is you know, one musician playing three instruments or one person wearing three hats and you take away the person of the persons of the Trinity, you get into heresy because now you're calling all three aspects of the Trinity Jesus Christ. That does not glorify the Father. It glorifies the Father that the Son would have the name of Christ, the name of Jesus Christ. So we cannot give the Father and the Holy Spirit the name of Jesus. It is not the same person in the Trinity but it is the one true God. Now, people will use many analogies to explain the Trinity. You know, in my old church in Punchbowl, that was like Muslim central in Sydney. All the Muslims come and live there. And so immediately as you're preaching the gospel, the question is, well, you've got to, you've got to defend the deity of Christ. You've got to explain the deity of Christ. But you don't stop there because you've got to explain the Trinity. You've got to explain the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. And so this is something we did all the time. And, and you'll use different, people use different analogies. Some will use time and say, well, see, time has three aspects, has past, present, and future. Some people use space, you know, time, space, and matter. Space has, is a three-dimensional world, world, length, breadth, and height. Matter, solid, liquid, and gas. 
Some use the analogy of the sun. You know, you've got the, uh, the gravity of the sun. You've got the light and the heat. Some people explain man. You know, man has a body, soul, and spirit, according to the Bible. Some people use a free-leaf clover. You know, free leaves, one stem. Some people use the egg, you know, the shell, the white of the egg, and the yolk. And they're like, see, all three aspects are required for that one thing to exist. It does more than one thing. You know, there are three roles or three, you know, uh, parts that make up that one, say, egg. You know, three parts, the shell, the yolk, and the white make up that one egg. And so there are analogies. And I'm not against using analogies. If you, I've used analogies to explain the Trinity. But never get to the point where you build your doctrine from your analogy. And I find that's where people mess it up. Because there's no analogy. There's no analogy that's going to perfectly represent the Trinity in every way, shape, and form. Okay? Just, it's three, and there's one. That's it. There's three and one. Keep it simple. Analogies are good to describe, but don't build your doctrine on the Trinity on your analogy. And that's another error I see people do. People use diagrams. You know, people use diagrams. They use, I don't know if you've seen the is and the is not diagram. They'll have God in the center and they'll say, well, you know, Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Spirit is God, but then they'll have the is not, so the Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not, you know, Christ. Or some people might use a diagram of three inter interlinked circles. You know, they'll have one circle, that's the Father, one circle, that's, the Christ, that's Christ, and one circle, that's the Holy Spirit. You know, and it, while they're unique, but yet they're interlinked, that one God. Look, again, I'm not against diagrams, but again, if you're going to build your doctrine of a di diagram, you're going to get it mixed up. You're going to mess it up. The Bible tells us in Acts 17, 29, for, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art or man's device. As soon as you look, they're helpful, you know, image, pictures, analogies, these things are helpful to convey some truth, but don't let that become what you build your doctrine on. Otherwise, it can become an idol, like it did for these people in Acts chapter 17. Say, so, Kevin, isn't it your job to, to explain the Trinity? You know, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I'm using the scriptures I can. I'm doing the best I can. But as I said earlier, you can only understand it through faith. Hebrews, 11, chap uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 says, Through faith we understand, so through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, do you understand that? Do you understand how the, the world was framed by the word of God? Do you, do you really understand that? You know, scientifically, can you explain that to me? No, you can't. But we do understand it through faith. Through faith we understand. And when you find yourself not understanding things in the Bible, let me encourage you to say, I don't understand this, God, but I believe it. And I'll just, as I believe it, as I put my faith in you, you need to help me understand it. Can I fully understand the Trinity? Can I fully understand how three is one or one is three? I can't fully understand that, but I understand it in faith. It doesn't confuse me when I read the scriptures, because I can see it sometimes here, and I can see it sometimes here, no matter where I see it, both sides are true. It should be simple. It's simple for a child. I think it's more easy for a child. You know, as many things in the Bible are sim more simple for children than they are for adults. So I want you to just place your faith on the Trinity. Yes, there are three, and there are one. These things are clearly taught in the scriptures. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. <clears throat> So in conclusion, in conclusion, John chapter 17, verse 11. I want you to notice this. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine, sorry, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Jesus Christ calls his Father, Holy Father. Acts 3. 13 to 14, Acts 3, 13 to 14. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified His Son, Jesus, 
whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desireth a murderer to be granted unto you. So the Father is the Holy Father and Jesus is the Holy One. Acts 13 verse 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. We know the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, different ways to describe him, to, to name him. The Holy Ghost, the Holy One, the Holy Father. Isaiah 6 verse 1 to 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 3, I'll read it again. And he cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You know, we serve not just the Holy God, but we serve a holy, holy, holy God. Why? Because these three are one. Take your song sheets. Turn to the back there. Song number six. Let's cry it out with the seraphims, guys. Song number six. Holy, holy, holy. I'll get you to stand. Because the seraphims were standing, right? Let's sing it up. The song number six. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, Blessed Trinity, holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim, Falling down before thee, which were ten art and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may. Guys, last one. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful. May be seated. One point that I do want to make um, that I forgot to mention in my sermon. Those that teach that God is one person being Jesus Christ and the name of the Father is Jesus and the name of the Son is Jesus. 
and the name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus, I will not fellowship with those people. I'll just tell you the truth. Why? Because now they're in danger of bringing another Jesus. All right? We are not to fellowship with people that have another Jesus. And if it's, if it's another Jesus who's not just the Son, the name that glorifies God the Father, not just the Son, but they think it's also the name of the Father and of the Holy Ghost, that's another Jesus. And so I would not fellowship with people like that, just for the record. All right, I'm done. <laughs>